Great, guys. That's great. So let's go ahead and get started. So hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Chris Monahan, and um, I'll be your MC today. Uh, welcome to the March Austin Tableau Tug. Um, for those that aren't from the Austin area, we, we, have, we were invaded last week by South by Southwest. The things are finally returning back to normal, and we're, uh, things are getting back into the swing of things. We got a great event planned for you today. Um, but before we get started, um, I'd like to just uh, take some time to always recognize the folks on our advisory council. Um, you know, these are the folks that work every single month to put on a great event for you. They are uh, do everything from organizing the actual venues to uh, lining up the speakers, thinking of the, the, the topics we do. Um, so I want to give a you know, big round of applause to all these folks that help us out here every single month. Um, and uh, we'll also welcome a newcomer, uh, Nicole. Uh, Nicole has uh, just joined our advisory board as well. So um, if you guys want to go ahead and uh, join our team, please reach out to myself or Homer or anybody else on the advisory council. Um, we need, if you like doing marketing or event planning or, or any, anything with social media even, um, you know, just come, come talk to us. We'd love to have you join. We meet um, every other week. Um, for a quick 30-minute uh, Zoom, and we just discuss various topics and plan uh, plan the event. So um, yeah, if you want to join, please uh, please reach out. Um, we got a great event planned for you today. Um, we are, uh, first off, I want to talk about the agenda. We're going to do some general announcements uh, around the meeting format and some upcoming events. And then we have our featured speaker, Jared Flores, um, who is a longtime um, friend of the Austin Tug. Uh, and he's the solution leader at uh, Analytic Vision and also a Tableau uh, visionary. And he's gonna be doing this awesome presentation about putting some prep in the NHL. And so it's around Tableau prep and how to analyze play-by-play -play, uh, NHL data. So you definitely wanna check this out. And afterwards, we're gonna do our network breaking sessions, which is ask anyone anything. And Homer and I will be um, uh, moderating that, uh, that breakout room itself. So um, of course, as a reminder, as always, this is a live meeting, it's virtual. Um, we uh, always encourage you guys to turn on your cameras. So um, go ahead and hit the hit the video button there on Zoom if you can. Gallery experience is the best, so you can see everyone's faces. And uh, as we said, please uh, observe customary Zoom etiquette. So if you're not speaking, please go ahead and put it on mute. Um, and we definitely want this to be interactive. So if you want to participate or you think something super cool that Jared's going to show, go ahead and put that in the chat window. Um, and so everyone can go ahead and uh, comment on things. If you have any questions for the speaker, save, we'll save them till the end. Um, go ahead and uh, direct message Homer, and he'll collect all the questions, and we'll ask Jared at the end of his presentation. Um, also, we'll be putting out a survey, um, just a short survey. It takes about one minute. If you could uh, fill that out after the tug and just help us make our events better, that would be greatly appreciated. So a little bit of housekeeping announcements. We have a bunch of tugs coming up. We have one in April, um, it's gonna be virtual and it's um, Thursday, April 13th. And then uh, we have another May tug that's sort of TBD and we're hoping that'll be in uh, hybrid and in person. So we'll go ahead and uh, uh, provide uh, some further updates on that location later. And then we have another one in June. And then for those that have been with us for a while, you realize you, you know that we always take uh, July off for the summer because uh, for summer vacation and then we'll reconvene in August. And of course, we have Tableau Conference right around the corner. So for those of that are new to Tableau Conference, it's three days of just everything data. It's going to be May 9th through 11th, and it's going to be in person in Las Vegas. So this is the second year in a row they've done it in person. It's going to be bigger and better. Um, they got lots of great speakers planned. Um, if you can't make it in person, please go ahead and register anyway. It's a hybrid event, so they have a lot of presentations that you can view online. It's totally free. Um, I put the link there down at the bottom of the slide. So please take a moment to register and uh, attend TC. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Jared. And as I mentioned, Jared's been a long time friend of, uh, friend of our uh, advisory board. He used to be on the advisory board um, before we, we since split off and have our Dallas advisory board as well now too. And so he is the solutions leader at Analytic Vision, and he's a Tableau visionary as well as social ambassador. Does a lot of great stuff, um, uh, especially on social media. You can check him out um, around Tableau prep. And so uh, today he's going to give a presentation around doing play-by-play -play analysis with prep um, for NHL data. So with that, Jared, I will turn it over to you. 
Thank you so much. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Happy to talk all things prep and uh, all things NHL. So I grew up uh, here in Dallas, Texas, always as a kid, loved watching hockey, uh, felt like the oddball because everybody else was watching the Cowboys and I didn't care much for the Cowboys. Um, but yeah, uh, I knew once I started getting into Tableau and doing more um, at some point, I wanted to do something like this, a project like this, analyzing the NHL data. Um, I had done a couple of dashboards in the past, um, really more not necessarily the actual on ice data, but just kind of career statistics and um, timelines of certain players' careers. Um, and so I had kind of branched into that a little bit. And then right around the time that uh, chat GPT started blowing up and everybody was using it. I was like, you know, I wonder if if I could actually use this to help me uh, with, with with what I'm trying to do. And I had seen a couple of blogs and seen that the uh, NHL API was was actually pretty public. I wasn't aware of everything that was in there when I started looking into it. Um, but yeah, I just started with, you know, I just want to get some shot data and see what I can do with that. Um, and Really kind of the, once I really started digging into it, um, my main sort of jump off point or my main inspiration was actually this page here. It's just the NHL stat page. Um, and I'll, I check it out from time to time. You can pick, you know, what season you want to look at, what team and what player. And it just kind of has, um, really, it's really basic, right? I mean, it has their current season stats up here. So you can see, you know, what the, how many games they've played, goals, assists points you can get a kind of view of what their last five games were but um, that's kind of it it's just a table of some career stats but I did I you know I like the, the layout and all of the logos and the, the way it's designed and so I thought you know I want to see if I can at least kind of take in this idea of the headshot and their their position their their stats and their team and see if I can work with that as as I start to build out the dashboard. And so there was a lot of different elements that I was gonna need, right? I was gonna need um, the, the, the team rosters. Um, I was gonna need the uh, details of the players. What is their current position? What is their current age, their uh, weight and height? Um, there's also these details over here, right? Uh, birthplace, which hand they shoot when they were drafted. Um, but then also just the game information. Right. I needed, I knew that I wanted to get some of that as well and then dig into the shot data. And so uh, by reading through some blogs and stuff, I found this API here. Um, let me go back one, actually. So the API is actually just um, this piece here. So it's this stats api.web.nhl.com slash API slash V1. So that's the main link to the API and it's completely free and public. And I, I hit it hundreds of times a day. So I've, I've never run into any sort of limit. Um, it's just there and they capture everything. And that's pretty unusual. Uh, you know, you don't run into data like that very often. Usually it's behind some kind of wall. You need a developer key, a developer um, account of, of some sort. And it, it's so really complicated to try and even get to the point where you're ready to start extracting the data. But for the NHL API, I was really excited to see that it was just there. Um, and so this page that I'm looking at here, it's just a list of all of the different endpoints that you can look at. So you can see there's, uh, they have a table or a, a configuration where you can see all of the languages. They have a configuration where you can see game types and you can see um, schedules, you can see uh, game statuses, plays. So they have all of these different uh, endpoints that you can go in and expand on. And so that's where I brought in ChatGPT Chat to say, okay, um, I know that uh, this, at least this main link here is where all of the configurations are. So I told ChatGPT, write me a Python script that gets a list of every player on every team and then gets all of their positional details and then gets every single play for every single game they've ever been in. And for the most part, it gave me like 95% of what I needed. 
Um, and I just had to make some adjustments, the little tweaks uh, here and there to really get the, the language right or make it do what I wanted it to do. Because um, not only did I want to hit the, the end point and, and get the data, but I also wanted to extract that data in a nice table format that I could then throw into Tableau Prep because I figured there was going to be some additional uh, things that I wanted to clean. So without diving too deep into the world of uh, Python and, and JSON and all of that, um, I'll start digging into what I actually did once I was able to, to get this data out. Um, and, and, and then, like I said, I split it into a couple of different things. I have um, one table that is all every single event for every single game. So it's just the play by play data and it captures everything like uh, the game started. That's an event. Uh, the, the game was scheduled to start. That was an event. But then every face off, every hit, uh, shot, blocked shot, missed shot, um, goals, uh, penalties, all of that gets captured. Um, and the really cool thing about it, which I've tapped into a little bit, and I, I want to expand on more, but but this this API is near real time. So when something, if you're watching a game, you can hit the API and get the play by play data within two minutes of it actually happening. Um, so what I'll typically do when I'm watching a game, I have a separate flow that is connected to the real time uh endpoint and so during intermission i'll go and run it and kind of see what where everything lies um so far through the game so it's it's really interesting way to consume the sport being a fan of it for so long um but then once you really spend the time with the data and dig in you find all kinds of interesting uh patterns and and things that you might not have just observed even if you've been following uh, every game so play by play data um, and then I've got this this uh, team list up here because uh, you know some of the some of the tables don't store everything the same way. So the play by play table stores the full team name. The team list that I have here actually stores if I pull in a clean branch and look at it, this one actually just stores a list of uh, each team and the abbreviate the three letter abbreviation for the team and i needed that because there are other tables other data that i'm trying to join this to where it only uses the abbreviation or it only uses the full name so i wanted to make sure i included both um now the play by play data is uh tricky to, to when, as when it first comes out so you know like i said it's it's every single event so you can see Here's the game scheduled, that's an event. The period is ready to start, that's an event. Now the period started and there's, there you can see the descriptions here, there was an icing. A uh, goalie stopped the puck, another icing. The puck went into the netting, the puck went into the crowd. So all kinds of, of goodies captured here. But where it started to get, um, once I spent time with it and I was like, oh, okay, so I can see there's, you know, there's goals and there's uh, hits and missed shots. Uh, what if I wanted to be able to show Okay, um, you know, if you're a fan of hockey, you know who Connor McDavid is. And so it's like, what if I wanted to track uh, when he scores a goal, how many times is he scoring against the Sharks? Or how many times is he scoring against uh, Linus Olmark? Or who's assisting him the most? Um, the data is here, but it wasn't so straightforward. So if I were to just kind of look at a goal event here, um, the way that it's actually captured is every player uh, that would interact with that goal is captured um, sometimes on the same line, most of the times on separate lines. And so that's where it kind of became challenging to piece together. But if I look at this goal here, this uh, first event, uh, they've got some really awesome descriptions and I've don't know if it'll let me expand it out here real quick. Let me expand this, click on goal. So you can even see it says that uh, uh, Nosen, this was his 11th goal of the season. He scored with a snapshot and he was assisted by Jesper Fast and someone else. And so it, it has all of that information on one line, but then 
if I come over here and scroll a little bit further, there's some some team there's some um, some player columns that are tied to each event. So for this goal, that event we're looking at, it looks like Jordan Stahl is the player name for this specific row, and the player type for this row is an assist. And so that's where I started to run into a little bit of trouble. Now, it is nice that the data is captured this way, but also because of the specific way that I wanted to show it in the dashboard, I wanted to be able to say in plain language, Connor McDavid scored a goal on this goalie and was assisted by player one and player two. And so I had to take four rows of data and try to get them into one row of data. Um, because yeah, each player type is on the different roles. So the assister, the goalie, um, the scorer, uh, every, everything is on its own row. So events definitely have multiple players tied to it. And the way that I got around that was basically using a bunch of different uh, LOD calculations. So here in this step, this one is where I formatted my goals here. So it says format goals along each row so that each row for the goal has the scorer assists goal for team, goal against team, and goalie scored against. So I'm just trying to describe, I usually when I'm building my prep flows, try to document as I'm going through everything that's happening. So in this step, I'm specifically extracting out every value. So anytime there is a goal event, um, there is a unique event ID tied to that, which is something that I created based off of the exact time of the event and the event code. And so I'm basically saying, when I'm parsing these values out, um, you know, I can find one right here. So I'm saying to fix at the unique event ID, give me the goal scored by player. So now when I click on a, or fix in on a goal event, every um, unique ID is gonna have that, here's the player who scored the goal. And then I'm gonna parse out, here's the team that the player was on when they scored the goal. And here's the team that they scored against. And here's the goalie that was in the net when they scored against them. And here's the player who assisted. And also here's the position of the person who scored. And here's the position of the person who assisted. And here, it, you know, all of these elements that I'm trying to parse out to make sure that whenever I come to bring it back together in the dashboard, I have all of these things to display. Now, the, another key here is if I look through this data, I've got these uh, coordinates X and coordinates Y. So every single event also has X and Y coordinates assigned to it, which we can map to the, uh, the hockey rink. And so the way in the dashboard this comes together, it's just, uh, it's an image that I found of a hockey rink and kind of cut it down to some correct dimensions with Photoshop, uh, threw it as a background image in the map, and fixed my X and Y axis to the actual dimensions of a hockey rink. And so this X coordinate means since it's positive, if you're looking at the center dots, the center face off dot of the NHL ring, it's uh, 80 feet to, uh, to the right. Um, and this would be if you're looking, you know, it, if you're looking at it, um, where, the, where we're looking at like the home team in their offensive zone. And I'll show it when we get to the dashboard too, but, but that's what these X and Y coordinates are describing. They're, they're in feet. So 80 feet into the offensive zone and 15 feet sort of up towards the boards. Or this one would be 82 feet into the offensive zone and three feet down towards the south offensive boards. And so every single event is gonna have a point that can fit nicely into a map of the, the NHL rink. Um, and there's just, there's just so much information when I, when I started digging in that I started parsing out, you can see over here, I started parsing out the hits, the face-offs, uh, the penalties, the shots on net, because not only, you know, again, it captures goals, but it also just captures somebody shot the puck and they missed the net or they shot the puck and it was blocked by the goalie or they shot the puck and it was blocked by somebody else. Um, so much information in here and it's all being captured real time and all of these descriptions to um, 
that really help if even if I look at uh, let me see if I look at a penalty. So if I click on a penalty event and I look at the descriptions, so you can see here it even has uh, this person had a hooking penalty against this person, right? So I can really um, detail out uh, penalties, who's taking the most penalties, what kind of penalties are they taking, because even that is captured not only in the description, but uh, here in the uh, secondary type here. So this says it was a hooking penalty or a boarding penalty in sportsmanlike conduct. Um, just so much information. And that, so this flow here, I, I, I spent parsing out each of those values for each of the different events. So goals, hits, face-offs, penalties, which is what I wanted to capture. Um, here, there's this sheet, it's called uh, Money Puck Shots. So there is this site called Money Puck, and um, I can't recall the name of the person who runs it right now, um, but basically they run a model on all of the NHL shot data. And so based on the, those X and Y coordinates, and also based on the actual footage of the in game, um, there's some manual data capturing happening there. And so what they say is, okay, this shot was taken by this person. When this person takes a shot from this exact spot in the ice, how often do they score? But also, who was on the ice with them on their team? Also, who were the defenders on the ice on the other team? Who was in the net? What angle did they take the shot? Did they get a clean shot or was it a deflected shot? And then from the goalie's perspective, how often does the goalie save a shot coming from that angle uh, from that handed shot, there, there's so many different factors being taken into account to come up with a model that says this shot had 13% chance of going in the net or 20% chance of going in the net. And so every single, what this uh, data source has is every single shot so far for this entire season and that value uh, tied to it. And that value is called expected goals. And it's a very popular value in hockey analytics because there's this concept of uh, every time a player shoots the puck, they're going to have an expected goal value tied to that. And so over time, they're going to accumulate a number, a, a sort of total sum of every shot they've taken so far this season, their expected goal value is, you know, 18.5. What that means is based on who they are as a player and the kind of chances they had, they should have scored about 18 or 19 goals. And then we measure that against, well, how many goals did they actually score this season? Are they above that or are they below that? And where you get into this debate of, you know, what, what makes a good player, a lot of the times this value of goals above expected is used to say, Okay, this player, based on the shots they took, they were only expected to make 18 of those goals, but they've gotten 30. And so they're 12 goals above what their expected goals were. And so they must be, um, you know, either really good at making shots that are difficult to make, or maybe, maybe they're just getting a lot of lucky bounces. But either way, they're performing well above what they're, what uh, would be expected from a, a player who is the league, league average. And so this is uh, data that I wanted to be able to tie in to really go beyond that barrier of, sure, they got 10 goals, but how meaningful and impactful were those 10 goals? And this data is pulled in by doing some web scraping from Python. So there's just a, a little download link where this the person who creates this website makes this data available. And so I have a Python script that downloads it. And then I plug it in here to be able to join it based on the X and Y coordinate, based on the game and, and all kinds of different factors to make sure I'm joining correctly on shot to shot uh, to tie in all those values. So that's what this flow does. And that's a lot. I know it's a lot of uh, information I've thrown at you, uh, but I'm about to throw some more at you because there's there's even more. This is the, the first flow. Um, and we'll, we'll take a sneak peek at uh, what this does to the dashboard. So the that first flow that I just showed you is what gives me this view here. So again, kind of working off that inspiration of the NHL page. 
Um, we've got that view of the last five games that they've played, who it was against, what date it was, their sort of stat line for uh, each of those games. We've got the headshot, their uh, name and number, position, height, weight, team, where they were born. And then there's also this nice little bit of information that was added into here, um, which is the cap information. So this I'm pulling in from somewhere else, and I'll show that just in a second. But this is to be able to also say, you know, what is their current contract and how much of their uh, team's total cap space are they taking up with that contract? So Connor McDavid is widely considered the best player in the league and he has the biggest contract in the league. It's 12, 12 and a half million over eight years. And he is pretty much at the league max of what you're allowed to, what teams are allowed to allocate their cap uh, percentage for one individual. Um, and you can see the, the basic stat line is there, right? Games played, goals, uh, assists, points. So these, these stats here are the basic stats that are on uh, the NHL page. But with that money puck data, I was able to add these here, the, the expected goals and the goals above expected. And so you can see Connor McDavid, based on all of the shots he's taken, was expected to have 41.52 goals, but he is, he's gotten 60. Uh, best score in the league this year. And so he is 18.48 goals above expected, which is uh, really good. Um, almost the best, uh, not quite though. Um, and and that's that's a whole nother debate, but, but yeah. So now we're able to also kind of evaluate, uh, sure he scored 60 goals, but how good is that really? And then we can also see because I was able to parse out all of those individual variables. Now we can see here's, uh, the shot map. And so the, or this is the goals. Like this, these are the areas of the ice where he's gotten uh, some really uh, high scoring. And you can see when you hover over it, we're able to see in plain English, Connor McDavid wristed a shot into the net against Martin Jones on that date in a loss against the Kraken. He was assisted by Janmark and Kulak. The goal that he scored had an 18.7% chance of going into the net. And he scored it at 48 seconds in the second period, which means so the way they capture time of goal um, is since it says the time of goal was 48 seconds in the second period on the game clock, it actually would have said 1912. So it's just the reverse of whatever was left on the game clock. And then the final score of the game is listed there in the tooltip as well. So a lot of information just packed into that one shot out of or that one goal out of the 60s goals he's had um, and we can kind of use this map to see like what areas of the ice if you were playing against McDavid what areas of the ice do you want to keep him away from it's very clearly this this area here but then you also have some other insights because we parsed all that out we can see uh, who is assisting him the most here's all of the players that have assisted him this year and if we want to drill into that further let's click on dry sidle and see Okay, so these are the this area here is is where Drysidle and McDavid as a duo are effective. Or if I wanted to see what about Hyman, let me click him. And so again, kind of this this area up here is where Hyman and uh, McDavid as a duo are going to be effective. And you can see what type of goals he's scoring uh, and filter down to if I wanted to see snapshots where are those coming in. Um, no, those are all around the, the circle right there that those are coming in. Um, where, what goalies is he scoring against the most? What teams is he scoring against the most? So now we've got all of that broken out that we can filter down into the drill in. And so from a team perspective, you know, if I was uh, with one of these teams, I could use this to not only evaluate like, okay, how are our players doing? But also, hey, we're going to play against this guy today. Um, what do we need to look out for? What areas does he like to hang around? And also, if he's hanging around that area, who else do we need to be on the lookout for for passing and, and chance opportunities? Um, same with assists here. So not only do we have, here's the areas on the ice where McDavid is scoring, but now in the assists section, we can see here's the areas on the ice where uh, he is passing to others, do, making effective passes that lead to goals. And it just kind of seems there's this pattern of uh, let's not let him get anywhere near the net, basically. Um, 
and it, we can filter that by who he's assisting, the types of goals that he is assisting with, and then again, the teams and the goal, goalies that he is assisting. And, and that same information as far as um, the language, who scored the goal, what type of goal it was, what who the goalie was, if it was a win or a loss, what the final score was, all of that is in here. Also, same thing for um, hits. So for hits, we can see uh, the map is going to show where he is hitting, so where Connor McDavid is hitting um, around. And uh some also some language so who he hit what game it was what the date was and also the position of the person he hit and the time and the period of the hit and that's broken down to um who he is hitting uh the teams he's hitting and uh positions and periods you know what i am a little tired of talking about Connor McDavid, and so let's let's talk about some some hometown heroes, some some Jamie Ben, some Dallas Stars, right? Because uh, one thing about Jamie Ben is uh, he's a guy who really likes to hit. Uh, he really likes to hit and rile his team up, um, and be the aggressor of the team. And so you can kind of see all around the boards, which is uh, I mean, around the boards, there there's not much as far as analytical insights we're getting from where they're hitting. Right. But it's still something that we can use to drill in and see um, where are they making more hits? When are they making those hits? So you can see that Ben is making most of his hits in the third period, which if you keep up with the stars, you know that they've had some third period troubles uh, very often, um, very, very large and looming this season. And so that's something that he is using as a sort of motivator to get back into the game when when we've. Uh, kind of let it let the emotions and motivations die down a little bit so still a lot more information here all the penalties uh what kind of penalties and everything um but really down here too uh this is one of my favorite parts in here so this tracks uh each of these pie charts or donut charts are on a face-off dot and so this tracks how effective uh each player is in all of those face-off dots and so you can see uh in the center circle he wins 58% of the time. He's won 50 face-offs and lost to 36 face-offs in that circle. And so you can kind of go through and look at the different circles and see like how effective is he um, in each of these areas? Is, is there any pattern here? Is there any dot that we would want to keep him away from? It, it could be due to also, uh, there's definitely some more insights as far as like what period are these face-offs? Is it uh, before a penalty or um, was it, uh, after an icing like there's a lot of factors in here that I'm not capturing which will have a lot of value from an analytical point but really just this is just to kind of show overall how effective is he on the face-off dot and um, from all of the green here you could tell he's one of the more effective uh, face-off players in the league and then at the very bottom here you've just got your standard game log that you can go through and look at what their game by game uh, line stats were so far this season and you can see uh, this is actually utilizing the image roles that rolled out in 2022.4 to get all of those logo logos uh, in line with the, the actual table and last thing um, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on this prep flow because it's a lot so this is the second prep flow and I'm going to zoom out just so you can see that there's there's a bunch of stuff going on here um, this is the second prep flow that feeds into the, the dashboard because there is, there are, there's the NHL API, so much data there, but there's also so much data that it's not capturing, uh, such as passing data. It, it's not capturing passing data at all. Uh, it's not capturing um, who's on the ice at the time of a goal. Uh, who is, uh, when somebody enters into their own zone, how effective are they doing that? When they enter into the defensive zone, how effective are they? How effective are they on creating goal scoring chances? What kind of goal scoring chances are they creating aside from just um, passing? You know, are they, is it a rebound opportunity? Is it a one-timer opportunity? So there are people who have dedicated large amounts of their time to painstakingly watch every single game and capture all of this stuff. Um, and so there is a fellow, um, he runs a project called All Three Zones, and he captures a lot of this, this information manually. And so I 
he allowed me to uh, access the Dropbox where he uh, stores the data and I can pull that out now and tie that into each, each player to get something a little bit better. So my dashboard originally when I first built it was just, is this person scoring? Where are they scoring? With some of these, we can actually start to evaluate, okay, but how many goals are they scoring per 60 minutes? If we scale everybody and say, let's only look at uh, 5v5 time on the ice. Let's not look at penalties and power plays and, and any, any of that. Let's just say when it's even strength, the, the scales are the same. How effective are these players and how can we rank them to say this is a good player and this is a not so good player. Um, and so I could spend a bunch of time talking about all of the, the intricacies of the metrics there. Um, but I will just say in short, that's what this, this uh, prep flow is doing. So you can see here, I've got some direct connections to Dropbox data. And so those pull in for the last three seasons and union that data together. And the reason we use the last three seasons is so that way, not only can we say, well, how are they doing this year? But then we can start to create some kind of predictive model to say at the end of this season, when I look at Jamie Ben, I have three seasons worth of data. If I do a, a, a three year weighted average of the past three seasons, I have some kind of prediction of how well I think he'll do next year. Um, where, and the way we weight that is this season would be have the heaviest weight. The season from three years ago would have the, the least amount of weight to it. Um, I bring in, um, there's this other data that I'm bringing in here. It's called the natural stat trick. It's a, it's a website, another person who's capturing other metrics around um, sort of their own models running um, expected goal values and um, uh, goal differentials. Uh, and so I'm bringing in all of that data as well. And then I get to this uh, point over here where you can see I pivot the metrics and then do some weighted averages. And so when I pivot the metrics and do weighted averages, what I'm doing is I am scaling everything to 60 minutes to say, I want all of these metrics to be on a per 60 minutes of, of ice time on uh, uh, 5v5. And so that way I can get to this point where I can say each of these metrics, um, what, the, what the actual value is, and, and then what their percentile rank is. And so there's this idea that, you know, we could use Z-scores, um, but in the hockey community, it, it's kind of a preference. Do you want to do Z-scores? Do you want to do percentile ranks? Do you want to come up with uh, averages? I love that these things seem to error out every time you do a demo. Um, so percentile rankings, what, the, what percentile ranks would tell us is if I am looking at... So Austin Matthews for the 2020, so in the 2020-2021 season, so two seasons ago, uh, when we're looking at this metric of individual expected goals, he was looking at the uh, three-year weighted percentile rank. His, that was a 0.9986. So what that essentially means is Austin Matthews was better than 99% of the players at his position um, over the last three years. Um, for that specific season, if, I, if I'm not waiting at three years, if I'm just looking at that specific season, he was also still better than 99% of the players uh, for that metric for that season. And so that's what we're trying to get to. This, this whole flow is really getting to a point where every single one of these metrics has a percentile rank. That way in the dashboard, we can have this um, this metric card up here to say, okay, sure, I, I can see all their goals and who's helping them and all that, but are they a good player or not? Um, and that's what this helps us determine. So every single one of these metrics are a percentile rank and they're per 60 minutes. So if we're looking at Jamie Ben, and I'm also looking at the three year weighted percentile rank. So this would be more of a predictive ranking uh, for goals, first 60 minutes, he is better than 81% of the players at his position. Uh, for goals uh, or expected goals, individual expected goals, better than 80% of the players at his position. Um, and you know, all kinds of all kinds of different things. 
you can see over here, he's got some bad ones. So he's not, he doesn't really do one timers often. And so he's not ranked very highly there. Um, botched retrievals. And so this one is, there's some of these that are a little weird. They're kind of reverse ranked. So like if somebody has a bunch of botched retrievals, they're, they're actually worse. And so it, there's, there's a little bit of, of understanding to what these metrics are and, and how they're being captured. But overall, everything is in the blue. He's in the 70s to 90s in most of these. So we can say, Sammy Ben's a pretty good player. Um, and I can, you know, I can pick a couple or somebody else and see uh, kind of what they're looking like. Um, and, and there's also another thing, another caveat here is that when I say by position, so you'll see here, Jared Spurgeon, his position says D, that's for defensemen. Um, and then for, there's there's two, right? There's defensemen and forwards. Forwards are who you expect to score. Defensemen are who you expect to help keep the puck out of the net. And so I don't necessarily want to compare defensemen to forwards because then every defenseman would be ranked terribly. Um, and so I split them out to where I'm only comparing defensemen to defensemen and forwards to forwards. So that way, even though Spurgeon only has 10 goals, he's better than 96% of the defensemen scoring goals per 60 minutes of ice time. So there, there's, you know, you, you want to be conscious of exactly how those are being compared. And so that's kind of what the prep flow does as well. It breaks those up, um, calculates them individually, and then brings them back into one data set to where I can start to determine um, the effectiveness of these players and then kind of tie that into now let me see what they're doing on the ice um, as well so it's kind of it kind of works both ways as a let me evaluate some things they've done this season but then also kind of look at like if my team picks this player up you know if I'm a if I'm a Maple Leafs fan and they pick up Spurgeon I can look at this to kind of see you know did we make a good pick or not um, and kind of uh, evaluate some of his, his on ice effectiveness and then see does that translate into a good player for the Maple Leafs because it doesn't always work like that. Um, I could talk about this stuff forever. I know we've got uh, like 15 minutes left. I want to leave some time for breakout sessions. So I will go ahead and stop there. All right. Wow. Well, wow. Jared, this is amazing. Um, this is really incredible. I mean, the, the dashboard alone is, is truly, uh, you know, impressive in itself. But when you go into all the intricate details on the prep, that that's amazing. I guess, um, I guess I, I had a question, you know, for, um, for those people that are, you know, maybe getting started with prep or maybe they've been using prep for a while. What are some, do you have like, I, I saw you, you do a lot of comments on the steps and things like that. Like, what are like two or three like best practices that you could maybe share with folks around prep? Um, yeah, I would definitely say uh, commenting uh, as much as you can to describe exactly what you're doing. Because what I found is not only can I kind of work between a couple of different prep flows and, and keep place of what I'm doing, but also sometimes when I start to type it out, I kind of think like that I might be overcomplicating what I'm doing here. Let me kind of look, go back and, and relook at it. Um, so yeah, definitely using the documentation. Um, it is probably good uh, if you to kind of organize your flow to do some color theory, like maybe when green and blue come together, it should be a yellow join symbol and the resulting flow should be yellow. I, I sometimes I do it, but sometimes I'm just kind of digging in and don't really care what the colors are, but that can be really helpful to really help kind of trace what's going on. Um, the being uh, conscious to like, if, as you start working downstream and you kind of notice some things that you made a change here, but that change maybe could have happened here, to push those things up here so that by the time you're working on these changes, um, your perf the, it's a little bit snappier, you're not getting so much lag. Um, and just to keep be just be mindful of of that. What things can you push up here that that could help make it a little bit more performant? Um, and then to be aware of your sampling. So I don't know. Uh, so twenty three dot one came out. Was it last week? I think. Um, and they did make a change to the sampling. So in the past, uh, it's still it still samples data by default, but in the past you could select. Um, there was automatic, uh, fixed, and use all data, and they've changed it to automatic, specify, and maximum. So you can no longer tell an input step to use all data. You can only tell it to use the maximum allowed sample. 
And my understanding is that is somewhere around 1 million rows. So be very careful when you're doing validation and prep that uh, if it is being sampled, you'll probably need to uh, run the flow or do the preview in desktop uh, to make sure that your validation is actually lining up and you're not validating off of a sample. Well, that's a great tip. Awesome. Good to know. Um, well, cool. Homer, I guess, uh, do you have any questions? Um, I know you, you had a couple yourself. Uh, I had one, and before I ask, uh, Matt Weber had one, and he wanted to know, um, since you're talking about rows here, how many rows were you in your data set? And I know you've already pointed out a couple of tips, but uh, are there any others that you could give to improve the performance of the prep runs? Yeah, so my data set right now, I think has around 700,000 rows. Um, so nothing too extreme. Um, it does still, there, there, there are still some things I could do to improve the performance there. Um, you know, making sure there's a lot of fields that I'm throwing in here that I'm not using. And now that I've gotten it to a point that my dashboard is built, I kind of have a good sense of what I want to use in it. I could come back here and start removing all of the fields that I don't, that I'm not going to use. So that's another thing you can do, right? Like everything that you know you're not going to use, go ahead and take it out. That'll help you with, that'll help you not only with your performance of the prep flow, but that'll help you with your performance once you get it into desktop, because there's not all these unnecessary fields to query. Um, you know, other than that, I know performance is really top of mind for kind of the, the future and what how prep wants to improve. Um, so I, I, I think when it comes to performance, because every time I talk about prep, people ask me, you know, why is it so slow or how come, you know, how can we get it to be more uh, faster? I think there's, um, once we really get under the hood and understand exactly what prep is doing and how it's processing, I think the, the performance that you, that we do see makes a lot of sense. Um, but really, you know, what, if you're, if you've already got it down to a number of fields that you're going to need, um, and it's still giving you uh, some, some trouble, you might want to try, uh, limiting it to, uh, a smaller sample size, maybe just, uh, you know, 100,000 rows or 200,000 rows, something a lot smaller. And even then maybe even 10,000 rows or maybe even 1,000 rows. Uh, I think something that I've started to play around with is this idea of exploratory prep flows and engineered prep flows. And so your exploratory flows, you're trying to understand the data. You're just kind of trying to get a, a feel for the landscape. You should never expect those to be performant. You're engineering a prep flow. You want this to be your solution, your curated data source those you should be taking all of the steps. And, and really, you should use the exploratory prep flow to understand what the engineered flow needs to look like. That way, you, you do only need like a 1,000 rows here. And your, your flow is snappier. And you can work through it snappier because you kind of already have a sense for what you need to do here. You just need to, you just need to build it. Um, and you're using that exploratory flow the, to help you through your building process. All right, very good. Um, the uh, um, the division you make between exploratory and production, uh, it's kind of like when you train machine models, uh, you have the learning phase, but then you have to put it in production. And at that point, performance becomes important. So it's the same uh, analogy here. Um, and Matt also has a follow-up question. Is, you mentioned that you wrote some some Python code to pull in pull in your data. Um, is there any like general rules of thumb, some heuristics of for you or for people in general when you might want to use uh, Python or some other or SQL or some other uh, approach uh, as opposed to just doing everything in prep? Um, I think it de definitely depends on what you have to work with and how comfortable you are. Uh, if I sometimes for me, it's a little bit simpler to if I'm connecting to a database to do some of my initial transformation in the custom SQL. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's it, for when we think about Python and like when do we use Python versus just using prep, that's more of a 
how comfortable are you? But then also what kind of data are you pulling in? Because like PrEP has some limitations with JSON data, which is a part of the reason why I'm using Python is to clean that up and parse it out. Uh, and then also anytime I'm trying to pull in API data, I usually have to hit that API through Python. Um, so for me, it's more of a matter of, uh, that's my access point to the data, not necessarily that I prefer using Python. Um, but also there are some things that, that can be easier to do in Python, especially if I already know, like right off the bat, I'm going to need to the, clean up the table structure a little bit. I can go ahead and do that in Python before I put it in prep. Uh, that way prep has less things to focus on as it's processing. Okay, that's awesome. That, that's really helpful. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, going back to this uh, change and prep that you talked about before, uh, where now you're limited to uh, 1 million rows. Uh, what would you do if you actually had to pull in more than a million because every single row was unique? Like, let's say it was a roster of registered voters and uh, you actually had to have every every person's in there, and it's more than a million. How would you approach that? Um, I think if it was something like that, where you know we definitely want to be able to validate all of the different rows, um, it it might be something where you kind of have to use whatever data source you're connecting to to do help with that validation because I, I mean I still think the profile pane that's here in prep is really speedy to do validation on unique values making sure everything is unique and then the information in those values all makes sense um it, maybe it's something where you kind of have to split it up and rotate it like you can hit the same data source and adjust the sample you can tell it uh, draw draw the maximum sample uh, right, like draw the maximum sample, but then filter this input step. That way, it's it's filtering the million rows you want it to filter. Because that's something that I'll I'll do in the input step uh, a lot as well. Is I'll filter it whenever it, whenever I see that it didn't quite take the sample that I wanted it to. Um, I'll filter like on the date or something, or filter on uh, like uh, the status type or something like that to make sure that it's actually pulling the sample that's relevant to what I'm trying to validate right now. Okay, that's great. Um, now I have a situational question for you. Um, uh, what you've done here is produced a tremendous amount of really interesting and I'm sure useful output. But ultimately, whatever we do with data has to have a meaningful outcome. If we want to keep our jobs, we can't just keep making pretty graphs. They have to move the needle somehow. So let's Let's say that uh, the stars hired you to be their new money, money bowling superstar, and you're going to take this data and analyze it and make a recommendation to the coach. Have you seen anything yet uh, from this data that you've been able to gather and display where you could actually make a recommendation? There, so that is interesting because this this data is is used quite a bit in the league right now and i think the challenge is the, it, it's it's that answer that we all hate of it depends because what i have seen and and it's it's so hard to wrap my mind around is i can see um here I'll, this this one is probably a good example so Jason Dickinson on the Blackhawks, um, not, not so great this year. Um, everything is bad. So when I look at this, he's uh, below his expected goals. He's below half of the league. He's, so he's below the league average in pretty much everything. Um, not very productive in goals, not super productive in points, not, uh, really contributing negatively to um, offensive impact. Uh, but I have seen players like this traded to other teams and excel. And, and it's, it's nothing about the coaching system. It, it, it can honestly be, there, there's this data to make a, a recommendation like this is a player we need to trade 
or maybe this is a player we need to trade for, or even we need to rotate the lineups and get them on ice with, with different people. That has to be combined right now with just plain observation with the player because it also it, it has to be combined with the observation of the player and also combined you have to try and factor in some of the biases there like uh maybe if we look at jason dickinson right now i'm only looking at the individual view but if i look at him and everybody who he plays with on the ice what is what is what do their metrics look like are is everybody kind of on the same level or is there somebody uh that he's playing with that's on a, a much higher level or a much lower level because it could be that the line he is playing on uh he's being dragged down by the players on those lines or maybe even though his metrics aren't so great let's look at the team as a whole and try to scale it down to the team and say uh sure when we look at league average he's not a great player but what if we look at team average blackhawks are not doing great this year so if we look at the team average, is this somebody who's actually helping the team produce? And even though he's at 24 points on the season, is that something that's providing value uh, to the organization, something that they need to continue to grow and continue to see how he fits in the lineup? So I think it's the, the more that I dive deep into this and study it, that's the hard part. And I also think that's the skepticism from hockey analytics right now is, is that's kind of where they're at is they're like, yeah, there's all this data. and uh, but uh, I've, you know, we see players all the time who are horrible, they get traded to a horrible team. And next thing you know, they're scoring 20 goals in a, in a really short span of time. Uh, we just saw that happen with uh, one of the stars, Dennis Guriano. He was traded to Montreal because we have had zero success with him. And all of a sudden he's one of their best score, goal scorers. And oh, it, we try it. There was different coaches, different line mates, different systems sent down to the minors, brought back up and nothing worked. But all of a sudden he's with this other team and it all clicks and the numbers would never tell us that. Um, so it's hard. I, I don't, I don't, I would not, uh, it sounds like an appealing job, but at the same time, it, it seems really stressful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, that is, that is the challenge with data is, um, how do you perform causal inference? You know, yeah. ultimately there is cause and effect, uh, and the data can help you get there, especially there's tremendous power in subgrouping. Like you said, instead of comparing the player to the league average, just look at the team. That's, you know, changing the subgrouping. Um, and uh, there can be a lot gleaned from that when you compare two different subgroups. Um, and, um, but the, uh, what you've done here is, is, is just great. I mean, I love it. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jared, uh, for, you know, uh, your presentation and, and insight into the data that uh, I think that the last take you had was very insightful as well. So everybody, let's give Jared a big round of applause. Um, if you guys uh, want to see more of Jared, check him out online. You can follow him, um, follow him as well. He has uh, Twitter information. We'll send out his information later um, in an email as well to the group. So Jared, thank you a lot. Appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. All right, well, great guys. So, um, so what we want to do next is we're going to um, we're going to have our 